Assalamu alaikum. This is Dr. Maryam Al Abdullah, and this lecture is going to be about class three malocclusions. This topic will be covered in two lectures. The first is going to talk about the different terminologies related to class three malocclusion, etiology, features, and basic principles of treatment planning. The second lecture will be talking about the management of such malocclusions. So our reference for the first lecture is chapter 11 from an introduction to orthodontics, uh, Littlewoods and Mitchell, fifth edition. So as I said, we're going to talk about uh, certain definitions and terminologies related to class three malocclusion, uh, epidemiology, etiology and features, and then we're going to talk about basic principles of treatment planning. The rest of treatment planning and management will be covered in the second lecture. So according to the British Standards Institute, the definition of a class three incisors classification is when the lower incisors edge occludes anterior to the single plateau of the upper incisors. The single plateau is this area here. It's the middle third of the palatal surface of the upper incisors, this area here. So the lower incisors should occlude on the single in plateau to be called class one. If it's anterior to this area, then we call it class three. That means that patients with a class three incisors classification, they usually have reduced overjet or zero overjet, what we call edge to edge or reversed overjet. That means not every patient with a class three incisors classification should have reversed overjet or what we call anterior crossbite. So, here, this is a class three incisors classification. Here, we have anterior crossbite affecting all anterior four incisors. So this is still called class three uh, incisors classification. What about the molars? When we say class three molar classification, we mean that the mesobuccal cusp of the upper first permanent molar occludes posterior to the mesobuccal groove of the lower first permanent molar. This mesobuccal cusp should occlude on this groove to be called class one. If it's posterior to it, then we call this class three. So as you can see here, this is the six, this is the seven, and this is the upper six. The mesobuccal cusp of the upper occludes posterior to the lower, a whole unit, like here, exactly like here, a full unit. So this is a full unit class three molar relationship. Uh, on the other hand, here we have also, the mesobuccal cusp of the upper occludes posterior to the buccal groove, but it's half unit, halfway unit. A unit, as you remember, is the mesiobuccal, the mesiodistal uh, width of a premolar, which is almost equal seven millimeters. So, if this mesobuccal cusp jumps posteriorly only halfway, then we call this half unit class three, exactly like this case here. Right. So we have here half unit class. Three molar relationship. Another example here, we have the mesobuccal cusp on the uh, right side occludes posterior to the buccal groove. Actually, this is not full unit. This is even more than full unit class three. It's like a unit and a half class three molar relationship. This is a little bit severe. The canine should occlude at the embrasure between the lower canine and first uh, premolar, but it's not. It should occlude here to be called class one, but it's posterior to this, and it's almost half unit class three. Half unit class three canine relationship. On the other side, we have class. Uh, let's move this around. OK, so we have almost full unit or three quarter unit class three molar relationship on the. Uh, on the left side, and we have class one canine relationship on the left side, OK? So this is the buccal segment classification. Um, the epidemiology of a class three um, malocclusion, it's less frequent than class two or class one, and it is different according to the ethnic group. The Caucasian population, it's much less than that of the Asian population. It's about uh, one to four percent. And according to Laura Mitchell, it's three percent of the Caucasians. Uh, but in the Asians ethnic group, usually it's much higher. It, it can reach up to 13 in the Japanese uh, ethnic group or 14 in the Chinese ethnic group. Now, what's the etiology of class three malocclusion? 
it's mainly, mainly skeletal. There are some soft tissue factors, some dental factors, but rarely contributing purely to the etiology of a class three mal occlusion. It's mainly the skeletal factors that contribute to such problem. Uh, as you remember, we have inherited factors or genetic factors that will influence the development of the malocclusion, and we have environmental factors. Both will play a role, but for class three malocclusions, it's mainly genetics. So if we say that there are skeletal etiological factors, that means it could be a contribution of one or more of these factors. The maxilla could, could be reduced in length. That means the maxilla is short and this will contribute to its retrognathic uh, pattern. Or maybe, maybe the maxilla itself is positioned is of normal length, but is positioned more posteriorly. Again, it will contribute to its retrognathic position. Or maybe the mandible is long, or maybe the mandible is positioned more anteriorly. Okay, so this is uh, uh, again contributing to uh, a prognathic mandible or it could be a combination of all these. So this is the etiology related to the skeletal problems in the anterior posterior dimension. Now, in the vertical dimension, the skeletal pattern is usually variable, it does not contribute directly to the class three pattern, but it contributes to the difficulty and, and prognosis of the treatment. So patients with a class three skeletal pattern could be presented with average vertical proportions or maybe increased or maybe reduced. So there is no specific pattern to the vertical dimensions. In terms of soft tissues, how does it uh, contribute to the etiology? It is rarely and uh, has an effect on the development of a class three malocclusion. Actually, on the contrary, if we have favorable soft tissues, competent lips and normal swallowing pattern, then usually the soft tissue will contribute to the dentoalveolar compensation that will reduce the severity of the malocclusion. When we say dentoalveolar compensation, this includes proclination of the upper incisors, retroclination of the lower incisors in order to reduce the severity of a class three malocclusion. On the other hand, patients with unfavorable soft tissues incompetent lips, increased vertical proportions, they usually have minimal or no dental alveolar compensation and it will worsen the features of the malocclusion. So uh, the uh, dental alveolar compensation is a result of favorable soft tissues and the soft tissues will mold the position of teeth during swallowing, during function in order to uh, to uh, to reach a more favorable position to reduce the severity of the underlying malocclusion. Usually the lips in patients with a class 3 malocclusion, if the, uh, uh, if the vertical proportions are increased, usually the lower lip is averted and full. So this is an example of a patient with mild to moderate class 3 skeletal pattern, as you can see, based on the A point and the B point, but she has favorable soft tissues competent lips, normal swallowing pattern. So intraorally, we expect to see less severe class three features. Dentally, less severe because we have favorable soft tissues. On the other hand, this patient has increased lower facial height, incompetent lips, unfavorable soft tissues. So we expect intraorally to have a more severe features of the malocclusion and um, let's say minimal dental alveolar compensation. What about dental factors? Do they contribute to the etiology of class 3 malocclusion? Again, it's rarely the only etiological factor. Uh, the only scenario where we have dental factors contributing largely to the development of a class 3 malocclusion is when the upper incisors are retroclined, plus minus the lower incisors are proclined, and the result is premature contact where the mandible is usually displaced anteriorly. So what happens, for example, retained A's or crowded upper labial segment. So the upper incisors erupt a little bit blatantly crowded. And as they erupt, they are being trapped by the lower incisors in the palate. So we will have a retroclined upper incisors plus minus proclined lower incisors. So the problem is dentally mainly more than skeletal or other factors. What happens is that sometimes the lower incisors uh, 
comes in contact with the other incisors in a premature contact where the mandible is forced forward to avoid such a premature contact. So we call this pseudo class 3 malocclusion because part of the problem is a functional shift of the mandible forward. So we call this pseudo class 3 malocclusion. So this is the only scenario where the dental factors contribute to the development of class 3 malocclusion. Otherwise, it's rarely the etiological factor. Now, uh, we finished with the etiological factors. Now we want to talk about the common features of patients with a class 3 malocclusion uh, from a skeletal point of view, soft tissues and dental factors. So skeletally, extraorally, as we examine the patient, we look for the soft tissue A point and soft tissue B point. Okay. Normally, A point should be ahead of B point two to three millimeters. This is class one. If it's less than that, then this is class three. Uh, it can be flush, so both of them are on the same level. This is uh, uh, not mild, so this is going to be like moderate, mild to moderate class three. This is more like a mild class three because A point is still ahead of B point, not more than two to three. It's actually less than two to three millimeters. This is almost on the same level, so this is a more uh, severe class uh, three uh, skeletal pattern compared to this one, of course. It's not as severe, it's a more severe. Uh, in terms of the convexity of the face, the convexity is uh, assessed by looking at the glabella, subnasale, and the pogonian. So patients with a class 3 malocclusion, malocclusion usually have straight profile or concave profile. The more severe the malocclusion, the more concavity the, the facial appearance will have. Now, if we want to look at the position of the mandible, then we use what we call zero meridian line. The zero meridian line is a perpendicular line that is dropped from soft tissue in point. In is the nasian. Soft tissue nasian is a point that represents the deepest part of the bridge of the nose. So from the deepest part of the bridge of the, no of the nose, we drop a perpendicular line uh, on the true vertical, uh, sorry, true horizontal line that is usually the Frankfurt plane. And normally the mandible the Pogonian uh, soft tissue uh, part of the chin should lie at this line or slightly behind it. So this is a normal anterior posterior position of the mandible. But if it's way behind it, then this is a this is a retrognathic mandible. If it's ahead of this line, then this is a prognathic mandible. And this can contribute to the uh, to the skeletal class three uh, malocclusion. Now. The extra oral examination can be confirmed and assessed using the cephalometric analysis. So we can go for the Eastman analysis measuring the A and B uh, angle or width analysis to check the position of the maxilla and the mandible in relation to the cranial base. Width analysis is to check the position of the A point and the B point in relation to the functional occlusal plane. Now, the common features, skeletal features that could be seen looking at a proper cephalometric analysis could include uh, fact, uh, factors or features related to this table. This is a table from a Coburn and DBA's uh, Handbook of Orthodontics, uh, second edition. I want to modify the second point. The second point is, is a little bit confusing. So we have short anterior cranial base, acute cranial base angle, shorter uh, retrusive maxilla, longer prognathic mandible. Now the second point, long posterior cranial base, actually is when we consider the Bayesian point is the reference and the length is going toward the, the longer posterior cranial base is getting uh, longer at the S point. OK, but sometimes this is not the case. So this the second point is a bit confusing. So we're going to go to anteriorly positioned glenoid fossa. OK, when the glenoid fossa is more anteriorly positioned, which is actually a part of the uh, assessment of the posterior cranial base, if the uh, glenoid fossa is more anteriorly positioned, then the whole condyle and the whole mandible uh, afterward is actually positioned more anteriorly. OK, so let's talk about these features after we explain our references. So we know the endpoint is the nasian and it's the most anterior point uh, uh, from the frontonasal suture. The S point is the middle of the cella torsica and then the Bayesian. The Bayesian is part of the uh, anterior margins of the foramen magnum. This is the foramen magnum here at this area. Okay, this is the anterior uh, margin of the foramen magnum. The most inferior posterior part of the anterior margin of the foramen magnum is called the Bayesian. Okay, so S 
N represent the anterior uh, cranial base, while the S uh, basian represent the posterior cranial base. Okay. Uh, the shorter the anterior cranial base, the shorter the anterior cranial base, the more retrusive position the maxilla is because the maxilla is a rigid part of the craniofacial complex here at the upper part of the face. So if the anterior cranial base is short, that means the maxilla itself is going backwards. So we have a more retrognathic uh, position of the maxilla. And this is how it contributes to a class three skeletal pattern. Anterior position of the glenoid fossa, as we said, it carries with it the, the whole condyle because the condyle is connected to the glenoid fossa through the temporomandibular joint. And so the whole mandible will go forward into a more prognathic position, contributing to a class three skeletal pattern. Acute cranial base angle. An acute cranial base angle is the angle between the anterior cranial base and the posterior cranial base, this angle here between these two lines, okay? between these two lines. So this is uh, the uh, cranial angle and we call it the subtle angle. We call it the subtle angle, okay? The more uh, acute this angle is, the, uh, as this angle reduces, becomes more acute, then the, man, the whole mandible will come forward and we will have a more class three skeletal pattern. The last two points are related to the maxilla and the mandible. As we said, as the maxilla is smaller in length, shorter, that means in, in, relative, in, in relation to the mandible, that means the maxilla is a little bit retrognathic, or maybe the maxilla is of a normal length, but it is positioned more posteriorly, and this is also contributing to a retrognathic maxilla. Actually, the new studies showed that about 60% of the skeletal class three malocclusions is related, more contributed by the maxilla than the mandible. And this is why most of the treatments like uh, growth modification and the uh, Orthognathic surgery actually address and, uh, the maxilla and targets the maxilla in its treatment because the majority of the uh, skeletal discrepancy is, uh, is affecting the maxilla more than the mandible. What about the mandible? The mandible could be larger, longer in length, uh, or it could be more anteriorly positioned as we explained. Right, so all these could be different skeletal features that could be present with patients with a class three malocclusion. Now, in anterior posteriorly, the patient will present with a class three, and this could go from mild, moderate to severe, or he could present with class one, okay? But usually, extra orally, we will have class three skeletal pattern. The mandible could be prognathic, the maxilla could be retrognathic, or we could have a combination of both. How can we tell you uh, uh, through the proper cephalometric analysis and through the zero meridian line that we talked about? The convexity of the face, as we said, it could be straight or concave. Vertically, there is no specific pattern of vertical proportions. It could be average, it could be reduced, it could be increased. Now, in terms of soft tissue, what are the common features of soft tissues? Well, it's, it doesn't contribute to the etiology, but if the patient is presented with normal soft tissues and normal and average vertical proportions, usually the patient is presented with competent lips. If we have competent lips, that means we have favorable soft tissues. That means we expect good amount of dental alveolar compensation. If the vertical proportions were unfavorable, increased, and the soft tissues were unfavorable with incompetent lips, then we expect to have uh, uh, different patterns, different uh, dental features. Uh, so a patient with competent lips will present with normal competent lip swallowing pattern. A patient with incompetent lips will present with two patterns. Either we will have um, incompetent lips forced together swallowing pattern, incompetent lips forced together swallowing pattern, or if the vertical proportions were poor and increased, the patient might use tongue to lower lip swallowing pattern to achieve the anterior oral seal, okay? So both will actually contribute to minimal or no dental alveolar compensation. As we said, the lower lip usually in these patients will be averted and will be full, as you can see in this case. Right. Now, what about the dental features? In terms of space condition, usually patients with a class three malocclusion, the maxilla is hypoplastic. 
The maxilla is small, narrow transversely, and short in length, which will contribute to lack of space. That means most of the cases will have crowding in the upper arch. The lower arch is usually well developed and we will have spacing or minimal uh, or will align teeth or minimal crowding. Severe crowding in the lower uh, arch in class 3 malocclusion is not that common. It can be it can be presented for certain dental factors, local factors, but usually it's not that common. The classical uh, space condition is crowded upper arch, well aligned or spaced lower arch. Now, in terms of incisor relationship, we said that it's a class three incisors classification, but the overjet could range from um, uh, reduced, but still positive. So reduced here on the centrals, uh, reversed on the laterals. Here it could be edge to edge or reversed. Here it's reversed on the centrals and edge to edge on the lateral, and here it's positive on the other lateral. So it ranges between a uh, reduced overjet to zero all the way to reverse overjet. When we say reverse overjet, it means anterior cross bite. The more teeth involved in the anterior cross bite, the more severe the malocclusion is, okay? And whenever we have a reverse overjet and anterior cross bite, we should always check for mandibular displacement. We should always check for mandibular displacement. Now, incisors classification, uh, as we said, the class three incisor classification, we check for premature contact. How? We ask the patient if he can bite his anterior teeth edge to edge. So the patient can bite edge to edge, as you can see here. And then we ask him to go to the maximum intercuspation. And usually this is achieved by anterior displacement of the, of the mandible. So here the patient can achieve edge to edge. And then the mandible is displaced on, uh, anteriorly to achieve the maximum intercuspation. And as we said, we call this pseudo class 3 mal occlusion. So this is another category or a variation of the incisors classification. Now, what about the incisors inclination? If the patient is presented with favorable soft tissues, then most probably we will have dental alveolar compensation. We will have the upper incisors proclined, the lower incisors retroclined with favorable uh, dental features. Okay, if the patient is presented with unfavorable soft tissues, then the dental alveolar compensation will be minimal or um, that, that does not present, is not, does not exist. Now, vertical relationship between the upper and the lower incisors, again, could range from deep overbite, average overbite, reduced overbite, edge to edge, zero, all the way to anterior overbite. Okay, so all are possible. There is no specific uh, vertical relationship dentally, exactly like the skeletal vertical relationship. There is no specific pattern that is uh, related to class 3 malocclusions. For example, uh, when you talked about class 2 division 2 malocclusion, one of the common and classical features is to have anterior growth rotation with reduced vertical proportions and deep overbite. So this is a classical feature. Okay, most of the cases of class 2 division 2 will have it. In class 3 malocclusion, there is no specific vertical proportions for such cases. Okay, but we prefer, we love to have average to increased overbite because this is important for stability and it will reduce the difficulty of management of the malocclusion. Right, what about the buccal segment relationship? We usually have in the buccal segment relationship, uh, again, variety of relationship starting from class one, molar relationship, to half unit class three, again half unit class three, or full unit if not more class three molar relationship. Now uh, sometimes the molar relationship is affected by local factors, not only skeletal factors, it's sometimes affected by local factors. How? For example, if we have an early loss of E in the upper arch, if we have early loss of E in the upper arch, what happens to the six is that it will shift mesially. So this will make the class three malocclusion less severe. Uh, on the contrary, if we have an early loss of E in the lower arch, for example, that will cause the lower six to shift mesially, and this will increase the severity of the buccal segment relationship. So sometimes the severity is not only reflecting the skeletal discrepancy, but it also is affected by local factors. So what about the transverse buccal segment relationship? 
as we said, usually the maxilla is hypoplastic, is small, short, and narrow. And usually the mandible is wide and well developed. So the usually the it's common to have crossbite in these patients. It's common to have buccal crossbite. And this buccal crossbite could be unilateral with mandibular displacement. So this is an example of a patient with mild class 3. As you can see here, the lower incisor occludes anterior to the single and plateau. So this is a class 3 malocclusion. And we have unilateral buccal crossbite. So this is a normal transverse relationship on the right side and a buccal crossbite on the left side. What happens is that as the patient occludes, we will have premature contact and the mandible will shift to one side. You can see the facial asymmetry. You can see the chin point going to the uh, left. And also the center line is going to the left as well. So this is a unilateral buccal crossbite with mandibular displacement. Or we can have unilateral buccal crossbite without mandibular displacement in cases of genuine dental or skeletal asymmetry. Or we can have, if the case is more severe and we have a more anteriorly positioned mandible in relation to the maxilla, we will have bilateral buccal crossbite. Bilateral buccal crossbite, as you can see here, both sides are in crossbite. Uh, so this is less severe, but still we have bilateral buccal crossbite. Uh, this patient here has the whole maxilla is sitting inside the mandible. So we have a uni bilateral buccal crossbite and we have anterior crossbite. All teeth in the upper are occluding inside the uh, mandible. Right. Patients with uh, class 3 malocclusion, it's very important whenever we have crossbite anterior or posterior to check for mandibular shift, mandibular function, okay? So patients with anterior crossbite, uh, uh, that is the reverse of rejet, um, if we have instanding incisors, that is few teeth are in crossbite, instanding incisor is an incisor with a reverse of rejet or anterior crossbite, okay? Which is a common feature for patients with a class 3 malocclusion. As we said, we always check for mandibular displacement. If there is anterior mandibular displacement, then this is good. This is good because it, it, may, it, it means that the uh, treatment is more, uh, has a more a success rate and it's easier okay, than patients with a true class 3 malocclusion and no displacement. Uh, but we always should check also for family history of a class 3 malocclusion because, as we said, the uh, class 3 is mainly determined by genetics and by skeletal uh, anterior posterior discrepancy. And this usually runs in families, it's inherited. So if there is family history, this is not good indication of uh, with more difficulty, difficult treatment and less success rate because there is a tendency of class 3 and that runs in the family. So as you can see here, the uh, anterior crossbite could range from one single instanding incisor to two instanding incisors, more than two, or we can have uh, most of the anterior uh, or labial segments are in crossbite. So all these cases are presented with anterior crossbite. We always check for mandibular displacement and we check for family history. So as you can see here, the uh, lower incisors are uh, the, the black uh, line in the lower to present the premature contact. And then as the mandible goes into maximum decuspation to avoid this premature contact, the mandible is displaced anteriorly, as you can see with the new position with the blue line. What's interesting is as the mandible is displaced anteriorly, there is a temporary displacement of the condyle from the glenoid fossa, but as the mandible goes into maximum intercuspation, the condyle head is not displaced out of the glenoid fossa. It will, it will stay there. So the, the glenoid fossa will accommodate the new position of the condyle, and we will have no disturbance of the temporomandibular joint. So this is in theory. Right, so this is what they found, and this is why in, in the past they used to have two lateral cephalograms for patients with anterior mandibular displacement. One in the centric relation where we have the premature contact and another one in the maximum intercuspation. And as they went with the research, they found that the condylar position and the anterior posterior position of the mandible had minimal alterations. So they stopped doing this. This is not indicated anymore. We take only one lateral cephalogram at the maximum intercuspation.
So this is an example of a patient uh, in the mixed dentition. She presented with a class three malocclusion, uh, complicated by congenitally missing lower fives, retained ease in the lower, as you can see here in the radiograph, and as you can see here in the um, uh, clinical photos. Uh, also, a patient presented with a potential uh, impaction of the upper left canine. As you can see, it's drifting toward the lateral. Uh, the point uh, from this uh, uh, case is to show you the anterior cross point. This patient, we asked her if she can bite her teeth edge to edge, and this is what happened. Actually, she can bite her teeth edge to edge. That means the patient is presented with pseudo class 3. Pseudo class 3 is easier to correct, uh, especially if there is no family history. It's easier to correct with a higher success rate. Again, you can see the overbite, the overbite average to increase, and this is again really good because this will tell you that the treatment will be easier and we will have better stability at the end of the treatment. Now, mandibular function also important if we have buccal crossbite. So if we have unilateral buccal crossbite, and again, this is common feature for patients with a class 3 malocclusion. It's important to uh, look for mandibular displacement. Uh, and usually patients with mandibular shift, uh, either anterior to avoid uh, anterior premature contact or lateral mandibular shift to avoid buccal uh, premature contact, both are considered functional shifts and both should be treated as soon as being diagnosed because it might affect the um, function and it might affect the developing of the rest of the occlusion and the rest of the craniofacial structures. So it's important to give priority for such patients and treat this feature as early as it's being diagnosed. So just to remind you with the case in the mixed dentition, this young lady is presented with a class 3 malocclusion complicated by unilateral buccal crossbite on the left side with mandibular displacement, with mandibular displacement. Mandibular displacement is indicated by the uh, facial asymmetry, the chin pointing to the left, and the center line of the lower pointing to the left. Now, facial growth, how does it affect the class three malocclusion? If the patient is presented with a class three malocclusion and they are still young and they still have some potential growth, then this is really not good. Why? Because we know that the Facial growth could go into three patterns, either the average uh, mild anterior growth rotation, which is the normal, or anterior growth rotation that is more than mild, which is not normal, or posterior growth rotation. So these are the three patterns. If the patient with the class three, mal mal class three malocclusion is presented with the average anterior growth rotation, which is the normal, then what happens is that the mandible will uh, occupy a more anterior position. That means it will become more prognathic, a little bit, but it will contribute to the, uh, the class 3 skeletal pattern. And if we have even more anterior growth rotation, then we will have more prognathic mandible. On the other hand, if we have posterior growth rotation, then this will reduce the prognathism of the mandible, but it will increase the vertical proportions and reduce the overbite and contribute to incompetent lips and poor soft tissues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, although it will reduce the skeletal discrepancy anterior posteriorly, but it will make the case more difficult, less stable, and more complicated to treat. So either way, if we have uh, average or normal uh, growth rotation or anterior growth rotation or posterior growth rotation, there is evidence that usually it's unfavorable. They, they compared the growth pattern for patients with a class three malocclusion in relation to patients with a class one malocclusion. And they found that patients with a class three will have less maxillary growth and more mandibular growth. So the pattern is already going into unfavorable, uh, producing unfavorable skeletal relationship. So this is a patient who looks uh, extra orally, uh, almost class one skeletal pattern. Vertical proportions are increased. The patient has in, uh, posterior growth rotation. So as you can see, uh, when we look at the cephalogram, we will see that A point and B point are almost flushing. So the patient has mild class three skeletal pattern, and this skeletal severity was reduced by the posterior growth rotation that the patient is having, but this 
really increase the severity and the difficulty of the uh, of the malocclusion because now we have increased maxillary mandibular plane angle, we have anterior open bite tendency, and we have incompetent lips with the lower lip averted and full, and all these features favors um, or sorry are unfavorable and will produce a more difficult malocclusion to treat. Right, so if we want to talk about the um, factors that we should consider when we plan treatment for patients with a class 3 malocclusion, the first factor is common for all types of malocclusion. Patient's opinion is the most important in terms of the choice of appliance, the choice of treatment uh, uh, approach or decision. Patient's opinion in general, for in general, is important because um, uh, it will show you and it will tell you, it, it will, this will tell you about the, the patient's motivation. Is it internal or is it external? The patient's uh, uh, chief complaint, uh, his point of view in relation to dental features, in relation to his profile, to his skeletal pattern. Because if the patient is happy with his, with his profile, then it doesn't make sense to go for uh, for example, orthognathic uh, surgery, so we can go for a comp more compromised treatment based on the patient's opinion. Our job as clinician is to educate the patient about his malocclusion, and then we leave it to the patient to make his decision accordingly. For class 3 malocclusions in specific, the severity of the skeletal pattern is the major determinant of the difficulty and the prognosis of orthodontic treatment. The more severe the skeletal pattern, the more difficult the case is in anterior posterior dimension and in the vertical dimension. Also, another thing to consider is the future growth. If the patient is still growing, there is potential growth, then this should be taken into consideration when we plan our treatment, again, in the anterior posterior dimension and in the vertical dimension. And we need to take into consideration the patient's age, gender, uh, existing facial pattern, of course, family history. And if we're not sure, then we need to expect the worst scenario in terms of future growth and plan our treatment accordingly. Overbite. Overbite, as we said, is extremely important in treatment planning for patients with a class 3 malocclusion because it will affect the stability at the end of the treatment. So if you correct an anterior cross part and you have average to increase of overbite, then this will enhance the stability and reduce the uh, chance of relapse. So this is what we like to see. We like to see average to increased overbite. This is reduced and this is anterior open bite, which makes it even more difficult to treat. So overbite should be considered when you plan your treatment. Uh, again, it's important to check if the patient can achieve edge to edge. So if we have cross bite, we need to ask the patient, can you bite your anterior teeth together? If yes, then this is good. Then this is good. Uh, so this is the patient edge to edge, and this is mandibular displacement to achieve uh, maximum intercuspation, and this is what we call pseudo class three. Um, we need to check the degree of dental alveolar compensation. Why? Well, because if we have a class three malocclusion, then orthodontically, what are we planning to do is to camouflage this malocclusion in some of the cases. How? By proclining the upper incisors and reclining the lower incisor, as you can see with the dashed line. This is what we are planning. If already the soft tissues have done a lot in terms of dental alveolar compensation, that means there is not much left for the orthodontist to do. The maximum upper incisor proclination to camouflage a class 3 malocclusion is 120. If you remember, the upper incisor long axis to the maxillary plane angle on average, according to the Eastman analysis, is 109. This is the average. So we can increase that up to 120 max. And for the lower incisors, the average angle between the long axis of the lower incisor and the mandible is 93. We can reduce this up to 80, not more than that. We have limits in terms of orthodontic tooth movement. Okay, so if we already have a lot of this in terms of dental alveolar compensation, then there is really not much left for the orthodontist to do. So this is an important factor to take into consideration when you plan your treatment. And of course, degree of crowding is important. We try as much as possible in class three malocclusions to avoid extraction in the upper arch because 
in the upper arch, if you extract them, this will increase the retroclination of the upper incisors and it will increase the severity of the malocclusion. But the factor that will determine if we're going to extract or not is the amount of crowding. So if you cannot produce a space in the upper arch to relieve crowding through other methods, other met non-extraction methods, for example, expansion, proclination of the upper incisors, interdental stripping, etc. If you cannot do this, then we have to extract. If you have to ex extract in the upper arch, you try to go as, as posterior as possible. So if we have the option between four and five, we extract the fives, okay? But in general, the, the classical extraction pattern to come off large class three malocclusions is usually non-extraction in the upper arch and extract in the lower arch only, or if necessary, if we have to go for extraction in the upper arch, we usually extract upper fives and lower fours in order to help with the relief crowding in addition to the uh, camouflage of the underlying skeletal pattern. Right, and important things to note when you plan your treatment are the following. The use of headgear, and here I'm talking about the conventional headgear. This is the conventional headgear. You try to avoid distalization of the buccal segment. You try to avoid the use of headgear because in growing patient, it might restrict the anterior growth of the maxilla. And we don't want this in class 3 malocclusions. On the contrary, we want to enhance the forward growth of the maxilla. So you try to avoid using headgear in class 3 malocclusions because it, it will produce an effect that, that is not favorable for such patients. In terms of functional appliances, so if the patient is still growing and you want to modify the growth, then functional appliances is an option, right? But the majority of cases where we use functional appliances are usually class 2 malocclusions. Class 3 malocclusions, we can use, there are some types of functional appliances that can be used specifically for class 3 malocclusions, but they are rarely used. They are less used than if you compare this with the class 2 malocclusion. And the reason why is because of the functional bite. So as you already covered in class 2 malocclusions, when we use functional appliances, we take upper and lower impressions, and then we take a bite that where the patient is protruding his mandible forward, almost edge to edge. So this is the functional bite. In class three malocclusion, it's the, it's the opposite. We try to ask the patient to bring his mandible backward. Now, bringing the mandible forward is easier and we have a wide range of movement, but if you ask anyone to bring his mandible backward, then this will go one and a half to two millimeters, yani max. Basically, why? Because this is the difference between the centric occlusion and the centric relation. The difference is about on average one and a half to two millimeters. So taking the functional bite in this position is a little bit difficult and you will have a limited range of movement and limited activation for the functional appliance to work. So we can use it in mild class uh, three cases. We can use it in patients with, uh, with a dental malocclusion more than skeletal malocclusion, but don't expect much from functional appliances. Now, in cases where we have severe a class three skeletal pattern, we usually need to consider orthognathic surgery. When we say class three skeletal pattern, not only anterior posteriorly, but also vertically. A severe vertical proportion is also difficult to treat, and sometimes we have to go for orthognathic surgery. If the patient is still young are you, and you're not sure about the uh, growth uh, pattern for that patient, try to avoid extraction as much as possible because sometimes you will extract and you will treat and then you will be surprised with unfavorable growth and you will have relapse and maybe maybe at the end you will plan for uh, you need to plan your patient for orthognathic surgery so please extraction of permanent teeth in the um, let's say growing uh, children with a class 3 malocclusion <clears throat> should be avoided as much as possible so these, this is summary of factors that should be considered when you plan your treatment. So patients' concerns and motivation, severity of skeletal pattern, amount and direction of future growth. Can the patient achieve edge to edge and the amount of overbite and the amount of dental alveolar compensation that is present uh, intraorally and the degree of crowding? All these are important factors to be considered. Now, in general, we have different treatment options. Uh, interceptive treatment for a class 3 malocclusions, 
block modification, accept incisor classification, incisor relationship, camouflage, or surgery. So these are the main categories for treatment options. We're going to go into a deeper uh, discussion for this in our second lecture. So this lecture here, we covered the basic terminologies related to class 3 malocclusion and the epidemiology related to this uh, category uh, of malocclusions, also the etiological factors and the different uh, features uh, for this malocclusion. We also talked about the uh, mandibular shift and the facial growth in relation to this malocclusion. Basic principles for treatment planning uh, was discussed and the uh, proper management for this malocclusion will be discussed in our next lecture. So thank you for listening. <laughs>